Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. Louis Fatoui, an author and researcher in Islamic studies and comparative religion. You are most welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Thank you very much, Paul, for inviting me. It's always a privilege uh, and an honor to be on your outstanding channel. Well, very kind. The honor is all ours. Sir. It really is. And um, for those who don't remember, uh, Louis is originally from Baghdad in Iraq, and he reverted to uh, reverted from Christianity to Islam in his early 20s. He has a PhD from Durham University in the UK and has published extensively on Islamic studies and is particularly interested in comparing historical accounts in the Quran with their counterparts in Jewish, Christian and other sources. He's also interested, uh, he's also interested in comparative Abrahamic religions in general, tafsir, that's Quranic exegesis, the historical Jesus, and Sufism. Now, the Hebrew Bible presents the Israelites as God's perpetually chosen people. Historically, Christians claim that the church replaced the Jews as God's chosen people. But in the last two centuries, a strong movement has developed that considers Israel to still be chosen in addition to the church. Christianity inherited from Judaism its misunderstanding of chosen as meaning best, which is irreconcilable with the history of both faiths. On the other hand, discussions of this concept in the Quran consistently conflate different terms and concepts. This video brings new insights to show the Quran's clear, consistent and compelling explanation of the chosenness of the Israelites. It reveals the misrepresentation of this concept in Judaism, which Christianity inherited. It concludes that the chosenness of Israel ended when the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, was sent by Allah as the last prophet. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Paul. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima. The subject of the chosen people of God is really to most people, a, it's been covered extensively and rightly so because it's been at the heart of history, modern and recent. In fact, it's come even more to the uh, front uh, in recent months uh, after what's been going on in Gaza and the genocide in Palestine. And um, the, obviously, this is because Zionism is linked directly uh, to the concept uh, of Holy Land, um, which is basically encompasses uh, the, the kind of theological um, problem that has underlined what's going on in Palestine. I should also add um, that I'm not aware of any supremacist ideolo ideology that has been so tolerated and encouraged and supported as Zionism in modern history. Uh, usually, you had always throughout history all kinds of um, supremacist, racist ideologies, but the majority of people, and overwhelmingly the majority of people, would oppose them. Not in this case. We have a lot of people who uh, support uh, Zionism. Now, the subject has been discussed extensively by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Muslims, of course, introduce a different angle to the discussion. Uh, I am. I think that the discussion of um, this concept from a Christian point of view and Jewish point of view has been covered extensively. There's nothing new I can add to it. Um, and, and all I'm going to do here is really cover the background to this because my focus is on the Quran. And that's where um, I, I hope to bring new insights into the discussion of this concept within the Quran, within the Quranic framework. And this is, and the reason, um, because discussions of this concept, even within an Islamic framework, has been really quite confused. And the problem is the Quran has a number of different terms that correspond to different concepts. Hmm. All of these occur in the context of discussing the children of Israel. 
And those discussions often involve references to them being the chosen people of God, the favored people of God, etc. And because the overall theme is so is so kind of overwhelming, which is about chosenness, about etc. Uh, people, and I'm talking about uh, people who deal with the Quran in its uh, Arabic language, uh, still actually find it difficult to disentangle the different terms and concepts. And what you find is that they are being conflated, lumped together, and we end up with a general idea about what the Quran says, but really lacking in details and those demarcation lines between the different concepts where something ends and another, another starts. And that's what I'm going to try to do here. And now I said that this is this, this discussion of this subject is really fraught with confusion, uh, mixing up even in Arabic. So even it's more so for uh, people who don't have direct access to the Arabic language. And what I'm going to try to do here as well is to focus on the critical terms that we concept and terms that the Quran deals with and give references. And hopefully people can also then, those who don't speak Arabic, can uh, go then and check further what I am going to explain there. So hopefully they can check for themselves the concept uh, and the terms. Because the problem we have is that uh, translation adds yet another layer mm. uh, of conflation on top of the discussion uh, that is, uh, the conflation that's already happening actually in discussions of the Arabic language uh, of the Quran. Even so, I will, I will avoid going too much into detail. This is a video for people largely don't speak Arabic, um, understandably. So uh, I will be avoided unnecessary details. And the details I'm, I will give will be the critical details and minimal. And hopefully everybody can uh, feel comfortable with. So there's not going to be too much details. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to start by uh, looking at this concept quickly from the Hebrew Bible uh, point of view, from the Tanakh. Uh, and then uh, just quickly, really, uh, to set the scene, because ultimately this discussion is intended to show the difference between the two perspectives. And then at some point, um, uh, I will then revisit or visit the Christian perspective on this concept after I have presented enough uh, of what the Quran says, because then we can see in better light uh, the merit or the lack of it of the Christian uh, claims uh, about uh, this concept. So the before starting with the covenant, uh, with the uh, Abrahamic covenant, which is basically where this concept of chosen people of God comes from. I just want to mention quickly that the first covenant mentioned in the Bible is, the, is a covenant with Noah. It's not the Abrahamic covenant, just in case some people get confused, thinking this is the only covenant. There are a number of different there are lots of covenants in the Bible, aren't there? It's not just like one with Israel. They're, 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 they're lots Pretty of much, yeah. Noah back in Genesis much earlier. Yeah. Pretty much. And that's what happens when you have a book written over centuries. So um, the covenant with Noah is uh, is first. Um, I think it starts in Genesis uh, chapter 9. It's all, all with all the creatures. It kind of promises that no flood will destroy um, the, uh, the people again on earth. Uh, mm -hmm. And it talks about a sign like a bow in heavens, uh, yeah. kind of reference uh, to this covenant. The uh, covenant with Abraham starts in chapter 12 of Genesis, first time. And then it recurs and references uh, uh, kind of uh, are made to it throughout. And then uh, the where I would like to look at is the sample um, text I've chosen is from, uh, from chapter 17. And here uh, we have um, Abraham, um, an old man. 99 years old. Uh, he had a son um, uh, from uh, Hagar, uh, Ishmael. Uh, he's still without a son um, from his wife, um, Sarah. And um, at that point, he was originally called um, Abraham, which most commentators would say that uh, that means exalted father. And then uh, God uh, changed his name to Abraham, uh, which means father of multitudes. And the reason because he promised him that he would he will become the father of multitudes of nations. Mm. Um, 
and then obviously what you were gonna will, won't be seeing in the text I am going to quote is that the covenant, including the Holy Land, is ultimately with Isaac, that lineage, not Ishmael. It's with Isaac. It, with Isaac. So it's specifically with that particular uh, line uh, of blood. If we go then to the first slide, and um, okay, I'll put it up. Yep. Is it there then? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Okay. And uh, this is the text I have chosen mm. with some highlights. I'll explain. So uh, this is God uh, addressing Abraham. Walk before me and be blameless. Uh, this is actually uh, Allah, God, uh, ordering, commanding Abraham to be righteous. And then it goes on uh, to say a few things. And I um, pick it from later on. And it says, I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan for a perpetual holding. And I will be their God. God said to Abraham. As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between, um, between me and you uh, and your offspring after you. Every male uh, among you uh, shall be circumcised. I have highlighted uh, a number of things uh, here uh, uh, in, this, in this quote. And what you see, first of all, is the reference uh, to uh, kings, uh, so uh, they will be uh, they will be kings. So a nation will become uh, self-governing. Uh, the reference also to um, uh, Abraham and his offspring. Uh, so the covenant was made through Abraham, uh, but it's with everybody. Uh, with uh, again talking about um, the lineage. Uh, of Isaac. The covenant is everlasting. It will never end as perpetual. And that includes uh, taking control uh, of the land of Canaan. And it ends with uh, that particular strange, really, reference uh, to, the, um, to the covenant, um, which kind of is summarized by every male. It's about circumcision. And this is, a, in my view, this is already a, a contradiction of some some sort, because that isn't what really the covenant is about. Yes, it's a requirement, but the way this quote ends presents it as if it is what is needed of the Israelites in order to kind of play their part, if you like, in the in the covenant. Now, when we get to this point. In the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, God had already actually uh, told um, Abraham uh, that the Israelites, his lineage, his offspring, had, had not been chosen uh, because they were numerous or they will be uh, the kind of largest, largest nation. Uh, he only says because he loved them. Mm -hmm. So God loved them. Why uh, there will be, uh, uh, there is no reference, no explanation. They were not numerous. They will become uh, a numerous though. Now, if we move to the second slide, I mentioned that God said that the Israelites uh, were chosen because he loved them. That really it. There's nothing else. They are actually chosen with that merit. That's according to the to the Bible itself. Uh, this is a quote I've chosen. When the Lord, <coughs> your God, thrusts thrust them out before you, talking about the evil nation nations in Canaan, uh, and this is God speaking to the Israelites through Moses. Do not say to yourself, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to occupy this land. It is rather because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is dispossessing them before you. It's not 
look at the repetition here. It's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you're going to in to occupy their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God is dispossessing them before you in order to fulfill the promise that the Lord made uh, an oath uh, to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Know then that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to occupy because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoke the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness, uh, you have become, uh, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place. What's quite amazing about this particular passage is how <coughs> God goes out of his way to keep on reminding the Israelites mm. that their chosenness is, is, is random. It, it just doesn't, there is no clear reasoning given why it happened. Earlier, he said, because I loved you. Now, the question is, well, but why did God love them? No answer. Right. The only thing it does, it just reminds them over and over again, and indeed, any reader of the Bible, then it is just, it's that it. There is actually no reason. Now, that's very useful. Why is it useful? Because then they can claim to be the chosen, the best, etc without doing anything. And mm. here, God is claimed to have told them, yes, you are my chosen people. The covenant is there. It's forever, regardless. Do, don't do, do whatever you like. You will continue to be my chosen people. And that's, that kind of, it shows uh, the ethnocentric nature uh, of, the, uh, of the language and the tone uh, of the uh, of the Hebrew Bible, because it, when you read this in context, you think it has been kind of set to explain the chosenness, just to end up to deliberately leave that concept with no explanation. And uh, the, the the God's um, anger at those nations that He was going to dispel from from Canaan um, is understandable because they are wicked. But then the Israelites are called uh, disobedient, rebellious, stubborn, and not righteous, etc. Uh, but no explanation was given why uh, they were chosen. And what's important to realize here, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, throughout struggles with this tension between chosenness and the rebellious uh, and disobedient nature and history of the Israelites. Throughout, you have undeniable, but also unresolvable mm. tension throughout the Bible. The Bible and the, the writers, the authors of the Bible, its editors never really uh, managed to resolve simply because they kept on, they kind of insisted that uh, Allah's choice, God's choice of the Israelites were effectively irrational, has no reason, no justifi justification. When you read that history, you really get the impression that God, God got stuck with them. That's the, the impression <clears throat> you get. And as a result, even though the Bible supposedly uh, present the history that God created through his actions, what it really, really does, being an ethnocentric, um, race-focused book is that it actually presents a history of the Israelites in which God is a played there and used as a player by the authors of the Bible in order uh, to convey the message, the ethnocentric message of the Bible. That's all I would like to say about the Hebrew Bible for now. Like I said, just set the scene because we will need to refer to it as we move on. Uh, to talk about the Abrahamic covenant. And this is the covenant according to the Quran. And um, I've chosen this particular verse. I call this verse the verse of covenant. Um, and it goes, and when Abraham was tried by his Lord with commands and he fulfilled them, 
he said indeed i will make you a leader for people he said uh, abraham and of my descendants he said god replied allah replied my covenant does not include the wrong doers interesting this is very very different look at the contrast between the two mm -hmm. uh, abraham when he asked first of all look at and i'm going to do quite a bit of kind of surgical analysis of the language of the quran here mm. women the reality and of my descendants he didn't say even the quranic language uh, my descendants as in, in the all of them no he said because abraham was aware he could not have asked any something like that even though he asked for the covenant to cover inquired ask depends on how you read it you can put the question mark you can remove it the meaning is more or less the same he asked or inquired with that cover my uh my descendants from of my descendants some of my descendants but even with that kind of restricted or um, kind of request uh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came back with a reply and he said my covenant does not include the wrongdoers because the covenant here is for for abraham to be imam imam means spiritual leader this is general term mm. doesn't have anything to do with obviously shia concept of of imam is just general uh, spiritual leader here and then mm. um, uh, at somebody who's at, in, in the front uh, even we call the person who leads the prayer imam of course so somebody a leader spiritual leader here so he promised him indirectly implicitly that yes there will be actually from your descendants um, individuals who will be also covered by my covenant to make you imam to make you spiritual leader but that only we will be very very selective it is not uh, going to be for everybody so one critical point to note here is first of all how accurate specific um, and selective the uh, abrahamic covenant uh, in the quran second it 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 kind of it's this covenant is personal it's individualistic it's about individual the concept of chosenness is collective it's about a nation it's about <clears throat> a whole people because of that these two even though the link is established between the two a clear distinction has to be made between this this is talking about individuals who will be uh, given the privilege uh, and favor of being uh, spiritual leaders to their people meaning prophets really and um, you can also put under the term of imam uh, those who are wise righteous leaders uh, but it doesn't talk about this wholesale chosenness of a nation so it's important to distinguish uh, between these two and um, I, I introduced really the abrahamic covenant only to set the scene this is a, frankly this very verse you can, we can have a whole video about that but that's a different story i just wanted to introduce it as the background and to, and yeah, to make but, yeah. a distinction between these two uh, and then so well um, from now on the focus is on uh, the collective chosenness of the israelites not mm. on uh, uh, the individual one now i spoke earlier about concepts and terms that are often conflated uh, resulting in really confused discussions and even though in by and large the discussion is ultimately accurate in in most aspects but it is in uh, inaccurate i would call it imprecise so the terms that we will be dealing with uh, there are five concept terms um uh, just to restrict them um uh, to just so we don't don't make it too detailed um these are the first is ahd which is translated usually as covenant the other is mithaq now mithaq is also translated as covenant often which is okay you can do that it actually flows better with the uh, text when you translate it as a covenant but generally speaking mithaq is a covenant that is you may call it sworn government uh, uh, sorry uh, covenant so there's an element of confirmed kind of covenant as if the person who 
gave that um, kind of consented uh, to be part of this covenant, swore, uh, took, took an oath to say, yes, I accept it. So there's that element of emphasis in the term mithaq. I've just used contract here, but like I say, uh, later on probably I'll, I'll translate it as covenant. It just flows easier. Um, but the reference is there. I always add the Arabic so people can go back um, and don't end up myself doing what I'm criticizing at the moment. Uh, the other term is ikhtiar or choosing. That's that's very much um, where we're going to focus most of the time. The other one which is related is tawil, preferring. And then there's the final kind of more uh, general term, uh, which is uh, uh, uh or uh, favor. Um, and as you can see, because of this kind of, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when those terms are used interchangeably, and at times they do, you do often end up um, with kind of inaccurate presentation. One common um, objection I've seen is that if you speak about the Israelites as, as being preferred, uh, some Muslims kind of object to that and say, oh, don't use preferred, um, say favored. Well, yeah, you can say that, but it's actually not the same word. The term for preferring, tafdil, is different from the term uh, for na'ma. So actually, as we will see, they are called uh, preferred, uh, not only uh, favored. Uh, so... So what is the covenant, uh, what does the covenant of, uh, mention of the covenant uh, uh, in the Quran, what do we have here? So this is one verse, Ya Bani Israel, uh, I've always highlighted certain terms, uh, passages to focus on. All children of Israel, remember my favor, that I favored you and fulfill my ahd covenant so i fulfill your ad covenant and be afraid of me now what i haven't highlighted unfortunately here is the word uh, ni'ma or favor but you can see these are two different terms and you can see that ad is distinct from uh, uh, from uh, from favor and what you get clearly uh, in this in the quranic um, uh, description of the ad is that it's conditional awfu bi ahdi you fulfill my ad, my covenant, and I will fulfill yours. This is kind of a two-sided thing, not like what we've seen earlier in the Bible. Uh, God uh, committed himself. You would say probably some will say regretted what he did because the Israelites let him down. Well, um, in the Quran, this kind of irrational uh, a logical concept does not exist. The ahd of the Israelites in the Quran, the covenant of the Israelites in the Quran is conditional. Now, what is that ahd or mithaq covenant? Remember the word mithaq I said earlier, it is kind of uh, most linguists would say this is mithaq is a kind of sworn covenant. It, it's confirmed covenant. And this is very interesting because it describes what this covenant is about. And it says, With Akhadna Mithaqa Bani Israel, La Ta'abuduna illallah, Wabli Waldin Yasana, with the Korbo de Tamu Masakin, Wakulu Nasi Husna, Wakim Salatu at Zakat, Thumata Walaytum, Illa Kalimin Kuman to Marum. We then took the Mithaq, the covenant, from the children of Israel that do not worship except Allah, do good to parents and to relatives, orphans and the needy. Speak to people good words, establish prayer, uh, and pay alms. Then you turned away, except few of you, um, and while shunning, shunning the uh, the covenant. So what what you see here is the, the what you may refer to as the terms of this covenant. This covenant it is. When you read it, say, well, is this about the Israelites? No, it's not. This is actually general covenant that God, Allah, always had with people whenever he sent a messenger, send a message. That's a covenant that he always had. Mm -hmm. That covenant or mithaq or ad is the same throughout. These are all moral. It talks about faith. So say, do not worship except Allah, monotheism. That's about a relationship 
with Allah, with God, and then talks about transactions, relationships, social transactions with people we live with, and it talks about uh, the worship, uh, how to deal with people in general, etc. That, if you read the Quran, you find the references to exactly those terms throughout the Quran, not in the context of talking about the covenant of Israelite. Just it's general, because the Quran says this is actually what every prophet, every messenger was commanded to teach and what their followers or the target audience of that uh, prophet messenger uh, were uh, commanded to do. So there is, um, and there are other verses I have not um, uh, quoted here, that's only for reference, that also mention other aspects of this covenant with the Israelites specifically. So it says, for instance, in one place, I've got here some references, Talk, take what we have given you uh, firmly and listen, talking about following the book, talking about the book, the Torah, uh, firmly. So follow it uh, to the letter. Uh, elsewhere, uh, it talks about uh, the. Uh, you must make it clear to people and do not conceal it. So about sharing that book, that book was sent to everybody, not for the elite, not to be used as some kind of um, a, a tool uh, for to take advantage, etc. No, it's for everybody. And then another verse, it says, you believe, you must believe in my messengers and support them. So another aspect, another term of this mithaq, of this, covenant is that the Israelites uh, must support the messengers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, sent to them. So what, what we should conclude here is that the uh, ad is or covenant, this term is general. It talks about general terms. Indeed, we found in the Quran the same term, covenant, mithaq, or ahd uh, used in other um, uh, verses uh, to refer to other people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one verse, verse 30, chapter 13, verse 20, he says, الَّذِينَ يُوفُونَ بِأَهْدِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَنْقُضُونَ الْمِثَاقِ Those who fulfill the covenant of Allah and do not break the contract. This verse um, uses both terms, ahd and mithaq, covenant and contract those who fulfill the covenant of Allah and do not break the covenant. So what does this tell us? That's one clarification I'm trying to make here, distinction. That tells us that the mm. mithaq and the choosing are not one and the same. The mithaq is just the terms, those moral uh, kind of worship uh, terms about how to deal with Allah, how to behave, how to worship, etc. Choosing is something different. So the question is, what is choosing then? First of all, let's just confirm that they are, the Israelites described as chosen in the Quran. Indeed, this is one verse. We chose them. We chose them with knowledge, uh, knowingly, over the peoples. Al-Alamin is a plural uh, that covers nations, peoples, etc. So that is a clear um, reference that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen the Israelites over other people or other people. Uh, and that term, um, Al-Alamin here, or uh, over the peoples, the nations, the worlds, etc., is not perpetual, does not refer to everybody, but it did and it, it refer to many, many generations of people, but it was not perpetual as the Hebrew Bible claims without explaining why and how. The Quran does explain why it lasted for a long time and why it ended. It's not perpetual, but it did last uh, for uh, a long time. And um, that's another verse. Um, يا بني إسرائيل اذكروا نعمة التي أنعمت عليكم وأني فضلتكم على العالمين. All children of Israel, remember my favor that I favored you uh, and that I preferred you uh, over 
uh, the peoples all all other people i think we kind of um, have to accept that the quran makes it absolutely clear that they were preferred that they were chosen the israelites were not only favored if you look at this second verse it uses the term favor and the term favor is a general term is not a specific to this particular kind of favor it used in the quran ni'mah favor to refer to anything that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us uh, big and small everything is a favor uh, and that's why the distinction has to be made clear between these terms so we spoke first about ahd and mithaq covenant contract and we explained the terms of those now we've come to these two verses and as you can see, the second verse here actually is repeated twice in the Quran, uh, where we have confirmation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Israelites were chosen over all other people and that they were preferred as well over uh, all other people. The question now is, so what does that mean? So prefer them for what? I mean, he asked them, or he commanded them, to worship, to behave properly, to follow the, you know, um, standard, if you like, terms of behavior that we all uh, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wants from us, Jews, Christians, uh, by and large, and Muslims agree actually on most of these terms. So um, these are general um, terms of the covenant. So what is actually the nature of that choosing? And that's where, um, they were chosen because they were chosen as the host nation of prophets. That is really the, this particular concept, explanation, does make everything that the Quran says about chosenness and the way it contrasts chosenness with other concepts and terms, makes everything just fall in place. Everything becomes consistent, completely understandable. And we don't end up confusing uh, different things. You can see from here why then we can't say that they were only favored. They were chosen. This is, was a very kind of unique um, thing they, they were given. Look at this verse. We took the covenant of the children of Israel and sent messengers to them i'm just citing here a couple of places where the link between the mithaq the covenant um, and the sending of uh, prophets is mentioned because when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i mentioned earlier that one of the terms of the mithaq the covenant is that the the nation to whom a prophet is sent must must support and follow that prophet that is one term of the mithaq. So the Israelites were also uh, commanded to follow these prophets uh, and um, support them. And uh, again, uh, there is um, here again, you see that in, in this verse, uh, uh, Moses reminding the Israelites, When Moses said to his people, all oh my people, remember the favor of Allah to you as he made among you prophets and made you kings and gave you what he never gave to any uh, of the uh, of the peoples. So as you can see here, the, the focus uh, on this particular kind of uniqueness uh, of having prophets because Moses is reminding them of two things um, that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the prophets um, amongst them and also made them uh, kings now kings is definitely not a distinction that that they had specifically there were nations that had a longer uh, kind of uh, lists um, and history of self-government and uh, kings etc that's not really what distinguished the israelites it's a favor to be able to self-govern and not to be um, oppressed by others uh, like the israel uh, in israel currently does to the palestinians that is a favor to be able to 
uh, to govern yourself. But that's not unique. And it wasn't particularly unique for the Israelites uh, who really spent a large part of their history under the occupation or control, direct or indirect, of bigger empires and nations. But what, is, what was unique about them is that he, uh, uh, they, they, they were the host nation uh, of prophets like no other nation uh, ever had. Um, and uh, when <clears throat> and then he says, and he uh, gave you what he did not give to any other nation. As you can see, that cannot be a reference to the kings. It can only be a reference to having being the host uh, of prophets. That is unique. That yeah. what made and mm -hmm. makes uh, what made Israel at the time through for for many many centuries the chosen people of God. That what the Quran says. Um, shall I continue, Paul? Or do you have any comments so far? No, I, I've just been uh, I'm just uh, checking with uh, my Abdul Halim uh, uh, translation just to get to, to see how he interprets the passages, and it's the same. Pretty much the same as you, actually. Uh, very, very interesting clarificatory points there about uh, how um, he raised prophets among you and appointed kings for you and gave you what he had not given to any other people. So this incredible, unique privilege of, as you say, hosting these prophets, these messengers, uh, uniquely at that point um, amongst the peoples of the world, as you say. Um, it, it's very, very interesting. Thank you for that point. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, now, it just um, another confirmation that they were the custodians <laughs> of the prophetic message. This is I've chosen one particular verse. وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَّةِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيْبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ We gave the children of Israel the book, wisdom, and prophethood. We provided them with good things, and we preferred them over the peoples and as you can see here again the connection between the preference uh, preferring the israelites and kitab book wisdom and prophethood of course these terms are associated with sending messengers so the connection between these two um is it pretty clear now obviously the the israelites throughout their history uh, had a lot of uh, prophets uh, sent to them so they were they acted as the custodian of this prophetic heritage mm -hmm. over the centuries they were actually the nation of monotheism um, what's amazing uh, is that how monotheism lived only there and continued only there in that nation for centuries it's actually very unique and amazing phenomenon that it could continue uh, for this long and be protected for this long that doesn't mean that they were uh, perfect custodians that's not the point because we know they were not how do we know because in their own book in the hebrew bible in the quran we're reminded and we're told that they did not follow the message of uh, allah uh, which was confirmed over and over again through many prophets they were disobedient and they are disobedience also um, got to the point where they actually even um, mismanaged the book itself. So it wasn't um, kind of uh, uh, perfect, but it was the best available. That and, and what they were doing and what they had is something that no one else had at the time. And as you can see, I'm setting the scene here uh, to show how this was temporal. Uh, this was not permanent. It's not perpetual. It lasted as long as there was no better alternative. And because it's about hosting profits, we will see why this was not, this could not continue forever and did not continue forever. And mm. despite its small size, and I, I should add, I mean, when we talk about profits here, we don't always, um, or prophetic uh, heritage, message, tradition, we also, we don't really think only of prophets. It's in, uh, in Islam, when we say the prophetic tradition, prophetic message, it's, uh, we don't only talk about the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We talk about all people who came after him. We 
confirmed and stressed his teachings, etc. teachings of the Quran. All these people play their role in maintaining that uh, prophetic heritage. Islam wouldn't have continued without those people who continue to carry uh, the, uh, the responsibility and privilege <clears throat> of being custodians uh, of the Muhammadan uh, heritage of the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. So the Israelites had prophets, but they had also non-prophets, people, righteous people, wise people, uh, sages, who actually play their role in maintaining the continuation uh, of this privileged and unique uh, position and privilege and responsibility of being the custodians uh, of the uh, uh, prophetic message. At times, I might just might mention it quickly. Mention it quickly. At times, we are reminded how the Israelites um, survived, and how, in particular, in modern times, how they become this nation, powerful uh, over all others, uh, suppressing, oppressing everybody around them, etc. As if it's a sign of God, and it's a confirmation of the prophecies uh, of the Bible uh, and confirmation of the chosenness of uh, the Israelites. Wrong. The history of the uh, Jewish nation is a history of calamities, of suffering, of all kinds of things. And uh, Europe knows better than others what it did to them uh, in, in the past, in the previous century, former century, in the 20th century with the Holocaust and others. So anybody who would use this as an argument uh, to claim that the Israelites, some kind of unique nation today, well, history actually uh, refutes that, uh, and it refutes it century for centuries. It refutes that claim. That claim is is incorrect, and it's obviously it's always associated with Zionism, the uh, overwhelming disease of our uh, of this time. Now, I would like to mention a Quranic subtlety that talks about the chosenness of the Israelites. And this is the verse that I mentioned earlier, but I'm going to now focus about um, focus on it in more detail. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِ يَا قَوْمِ اذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ جَعَلَ فِيكُمْ أَنْبِيَاءُ وَجَعَلَكُمْ مَلُوكًا وَآتَاكُمْ مَا لَمْ يُؤْتِ أَحَدًا مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ when Moses said to his people, O oh my people, remember the favor of Allah to you as he made, you, made among you prophets and made you kings and gave you what he never gave to any of the peoples. No, just note the, the, the surgical, analytical, analytical, precise language of the Quran distinguishing between this, this, these two favors. The prophets are described as being made among the Israelites, whereas the kings are described as the Israelites were made kings. The Quran makes a very subtle but clear distinction between these two. The kings of the Israelites were Israelites just like anybody else. So there's no problem describing the all of the Israelites by default, of course, by extrapolation as were made kings as in you were um, made to govern yourself so that's but when it came to describing the prophets who appeared uh, among the israelites where the term among you as if they are different they are not the same the kings uh, are part of the nation but those prophets are like guests they are being hosted by the Israelites. And that again kind of confirm this distinction and making and the explanation, interpretation I'm presenting here that the chosenness of the Israelites is actually chosenness of being uh, a host, the host nation uh, of, uh, uh, of, of prophets. And um, what's interesting as well um, is that often you can look at the Quran in its own right and find these kind of subtleties, amazing things here and there. And it always fascinated me, these kind of little things here and there that make all the difference. And then the, the, the difference and, or the power 
uh, of this accurate, precise language becomes even more clear when you compare uh, what the Quran says with similar passages in the Bible, Hebrew uh, or uh, the New Testament. So look at this, for instance. This is God talking to Abraham. I will make you exceedingly fruit, fruit, fruitful and I will make uh, nations of you and kings shall come from you. Look at the emphasis of the Bible. The word prophet or the equivalent of it disappeared. It does not exist. This is an earthly book whose writers were concerned with everything in this world. Nothing else. It's about being king, governing themselves, etc. But look at how that important aspect of the Abrahamic covenant that we mentioned earlier when we, we spoke about Imam, the spiritual leader, is gone. Look at the difference between these two passages from the Quran and the Bible. The Quran talks about, first and foremost, is the fact that they hosted uh, prophets. Uh, and then uh, the mention of uh, kings and the difference between the way these two things, two kind of kings and um, uh, prophets are, are mentioned. Whereas in the Bible, there is no distinction. Uh, they are uh, mentioned uh, together. And this is another place uh, where uh, God uh, talks about um, Sarah, uh, again, talking to Ab Abraham. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Look at this emphasis on just kings. That's what it's about. And that's what you get from a book that's focused uh, on, on this world uh, and effectively using what's what's this spiritual message original authentic spiritual message in order to, to turn it into um, a message uh, that uh, serves uh, people in this world and their ambitions worldly ambitions and there is nothing else for um, uh, of that left of that kind of spiritual dimension uh, of, of the message just eth ethnocentric um uh, uh writings and this is an example and there are obviously tens on many many examples of how the quran does not copy not only does not copy but corrects the bible in a very precise way in a surgical way it really is why would muhammad sallallahu think of anything like that why on earth? I mean, he supposedly was copying from the Bible. Well, the Bible talks about kings and the Bible is completely overwhelmed by this world and what kings do and don't do, etc. Look at the distinction and the difference between the two messages. The Quran corrects the Bible repeatedly. And this is uh, one of those uh, examples. So hosting prophets what prophets are we talking about the quran as we everybody knows really uh, describes all our prophets as being uh, as having sent with the same message sent by allah one god so they all taught the same monotheism uh, to worship allah and no one else etc all of that as well as they came up with ethical moral codes uh, for different nations, uh, different times. And um, that that kind of Muslim identity is the real and the real and identity and the only and the main identity uh, of those, all these prophets. So um, this is one verse. Uh, or do you say that Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants were Jews or Christians say, are you more knowing or is Allah who is more unjust than one who conceals a, test a testimony he has from Allah? Allah is not unaware uh, of what you do. So that's talking about uh, a number of prophets uh, and their um, 
and their descendants. And again, another kind of example: ما كان إبراهيم يهوديا ولا نصرانيا ولكن كان حنيفا مسلما وما كان من المشركين. Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was a Hanif, Muslim, and he was not uh, one of the uh, polytheists. Hanif is a word that um, usually means it, it's taken to mean deviated from something and the reference is deviated from polytheism so if you look at it in the quran it, it i think it mentioned 12 times nine of these is in contrast to polytheism in contrast to polytheism so there's no uh, ambiguity that uh, hanifism or hanif is a reference uh, to monotheism uh, whereas muslim is also a reference to monotheism but the emphasis in the word muslim on submission whereas in hanif probably is the main that focuses more on the oneness uh, of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now these verses of course um, also kind of draw attention uh, to the fact that the quran distinguishes between uh, judaism uh, and christianity and islam because why does that well first of all according to the quran and as we saw um, in the hebrew bible judaism is 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 an ethnic religion is is an ethnocentric religion it's focused on a particular race um, christianity is actually polytheistic i'm talking from the point of view of the quran is here it's polytheistic regardless of how at times Christians try to um, you know bend over backward to try and say otherwise it is actually polytheistic because you're claiming someone else is divine other than Allah uh, Islam on the uh, on the other hand is obviously monotheistic completely utterly purely monotheistic the other the other side of the difference between um, Christianity um, Judaism and Islam is is that these two are judaism and, and um, christianity the way they are, these terms are used in the quran a reference to something that happened and developed movements religions call them whatever happened and developed in a particular period of time so the contrast here is with something that is perpetual something that never changed these are developments judaism when you read about it in the Quran, it is a development, something that happened at some point as a distortion, if you like, something that appeared out of the original message of Islam and became something else. Same applies uh, to uh, Christianity. So that's, it's a difference between authentic and in, in, inauthentic here. And of course, um, the what we know as well is that the, uh, even though the the, uh, the Israelites were commanded to support uh, the prophets that uh, were sent to them, they actually ended up um, letting them down big time. Now, uh, the Hebrew Bible and the Quran talk quite a lot about the about the failure of the Israelites to live up uh, to what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted them to do to his commandments and the, there are mentions of historical uh, in the quran i'm talking um historical um, um acts of disobedience and sins uh, as they for instance when they caused all kinds of problems to moses uh, when they worshiped the calf but there are also a lot of instances in the quran of um, acts of disobedience that happened at the time of the quran so they were contra contemporary to the Quran, and that includes concealing parts of the book. So they had some scripture they would not share with others, the taking of usury, so that was continuing, rejecting, of course, the prophet, the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu That happened at the time. It's continuation, nothing surprising there. The Hebrew Bible tells us that it's a history of disobedience. Why would this stop when the prophet sallallahu wasallam comes? Of course, it did not stop so but this all these acts of disobedience as bad as they are there was something uh, even worse so why is this particularly bad not only killing prophets is bad because these are prophets who who are the highest spiritual 
um, kind of ranking um, um, human beings and the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is even worse, um, or um, in the case of the Israelites, is that the whole point of chosenness was to support the prophets and be the custodian uh, of their heritage. What they ended up ended doing uh, is killing them uh, instead uh, of uh, supporting them. This particular uh, issue is mentioned actually nine times in the Quran. This one example. And it's mentioned, by the way, a number of times by Jesus in the Gospels. Correct. The Gospel, the Gospel Correct. of Matthew, for example, Correct. particularly. Correct. So, لَقَدْ أَخَذْنَ مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلُ وَأَرْسَلَ إِلَيْهُمْ رُسُلًا كُلَّمَا جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ بِمَا لَا تَهُوَ أَنفُسُهُمْ فَرِيقًا كَذَّبُوا وَفَرِيقًا يَقْتُلُونَ We took the covenant of the children of Israel and sent messengers to them. Whenever a messenger came to them with what their souls uh, did not desire, they accused a group of lying and they killed another group. As you can see here is the kind of emphasis one example of the um, kind of how serious this issue is it's serious for anybody but it's even more so in the case of israel when it kind of undermined their chosenness by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so instead of supporting those prophets they killed some of them and they uh, caused uh, uh, accused the others of lying and as you mentioned, Paul, this isn't really a theme that is mentioned in the Quran. So before anybody jumps at the Quran, accuses it of being anti-Semitic and all that nonsense, this is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible and mentioned actually in the New Testament. As you said, this is the reference you mentioned. Oh, I, I didn't realize you were going to say it. Okay. Yeah, well, you mind uh, you read my mind so um, and this is uh, jesus talking to the scribes and the pharisees and you say if you claim you say if we had lived in the days of our ancestors we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets now look at the plural the use the use of the plural it's not in the singular it is in the plural so what is he talking about well this is uh, from um that's by Elijah. This is uh, from uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, according to the to the Christians. And the Israelites have forsaken. This is him, uh, Prophet Elijah, complaining to God. The Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down uh, your uh, altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Quite insistent. And what's interesting here, what I highlighted, is the connection between the mithaq, the covenant, and the killing of prophets. It's mentioned in the in the verse that I selected, and it's mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, in this kind of association. They have forsaken your covenant, mm. uh, and what follows is killed your prophets. That is, even in the um, Hebrew Bible, really implied that that's what I talk about, the tension that's never resolved in the Hebrew Bible. They are chosen, but then they do all of that. And the Bible doesn't know what to do with it. Um, so what it does, it ends up saying, chosen, 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 disobedient, 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 sort it out. And it's left at that. The Quran comes and resolves all this for everybody. Makes it clear what happened. Um, and and uh, I always say, People talk about theology. Theology for me cannot be um, separated from history. I never believed in that methodology. For me, history and theology have to work together for theology uh, to have to be any to be substantive and to be any to have any value. It has to be rooted in history. It has to explain history. If it doesn't, that theology is unhistorical. So meaning it is incorrect, it is inaccurate. There are other verses in the Quran that also uh, links the killing of um, uh, prophets to the concept of covenant, mithaq. I, I can't quote them all. I've got one here. I don't have it on, on slide. فَبِمَا نَقْضِهِمْ مِيثَاقَهُمْ وَكُفْرِهِمْ بِآيَةِ اللَّهِ وَقَتْلِهِمْ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ For their breaking their covenant, their disbelief, disbelief in the signs of Allah, and their killing of the prophets without right. That is verse 
4, chapter 4, verse 155 for anybody uh, who would like um, to check it out. Um, so what we have here is the Israelites, the, the image we get both in the Hebrew Bible, confirmed in the New Testament and clarified uh, in the Quran that the uh, Israelites uh, were consistently, persistently disobedient, not righteous uh, and sinful nation. That's what happened throughout. So, so they were chosen uh, in order, uh, chosen to provide support for the prophets uh, because they were ma made the host nation of the prophets. Uh, there, they that continued, that role continued for centuries. <clears throat> During that time, because of their disobedience, etc., they were far from the perfect custodians of the prophetic uh, uh, heritage but they were the best that was there and that continued for centuries until it ended at some point so when did end now we know that the israelites completely failed to support jesus in fact they tried to kill him indeed the christians and the jews believe they succeeded in doing that and that of course resulted in all kinds of misery for the jews and atrocities committed by the christians over the centuries let's not forget that but the quran uh, actually should um, make things a lot better uh, for the jews in terms of stopping christian hatred and aggression because it clarifies it they did not actually kill him he escaped allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him having they failed to kill to kill him so they're not responsible for uh, his supposed alleged crucifixion but they were responsible for the loss of his message remember what we said earlier their role is to be the custodians uh, of the uh, prophetic heritage where is the prophetic heritage of jesus anybody who knows anything about the history of the new testament and the history of early christianity would tell you whoever was there failed and failed miserably and completely to retain protect preserve jesus's heritage it is gone there's none left we have to work out what actually jesus really said and on the basis of the new testament and if you don't use any other better reference good luck with that and uh, western scholarship would confirm that there is really really no luck uh, in that and that goal in achieving that uh, but but like i say up to that point uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the Israelites uh, were the best available and uh, supported because they had this many prophets and because they had a lot of righteous, pious people. So that continued uh, for those individuals played a critical role in the success and continuation of that monotheistic nation to stay there and to continue to be the way it is. I mean, even after the Christianity, uh, which was within a couple of decades uh, turned into something that had nothing to do with Jesus and divinity. Uh, the, you know, uh, Jesus was turned into divine, etc. Made its way into Christianity. Uh, Judaism remained the way it is. It's quite, it's such a beautiful example of how it survived over the centuries despite all kinds. Now this happened right in the middle of it. Still, it remained and succeeded to be the way it is. Protected itself. And of course, people who wanted to seek real monotheism, their own message, and they could have found it, but they were far, far from being uh, perfect. So that's what they were, imperfect custodians uh, of prophetic tradition. However, all this chosenness, this chosenness ended abruptly and completely when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam was commissioned by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He was not an Israelite. He was from the lineage of Ishmael. 
he was he is the last prophet so there are no prophets after him there's no hosting of prophets to be exercised by the israelites he brought a new law the new law means uh, the one option that was available for people who thought monotheism is no more the only option available. In fact, he brought a new book that's corrective and preserved. It's, 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 it's authentic. It hasn't changed. It wasn't going to change. We know it when it was revealed. We know the names of people who wrote it down. We know names of hundreds of people who memorized it from day one. We know all of that. That history is contrasted with the history of the Bible, and you can see why suddenly you have a message, the like of which never, ever happened before. We've just been talking about the custodian, the nation that, that was the custodian nation of the prophet could not, of the prophets in general, could not retain, preserve, protect the tradition that was uh, revealed through those prophets, but then contrast this with what happened with Islam and the protection uh, <clears throat> of its book, uh, its message. And you can see there is no purpose. There was a purpose for chosenness. It must not be denied that the Israelites were chosen, but that chosenness is, is, is gone. And um, obviously, <laughs> Can I just add another point? Uh, um, uh, you put one, one and two there, uh, complete failure to support Jesus, uh, and number two, the imperfect custodianship of federal tradition. Another one I, I, I would add in would be the destruction of the temple, the Jer Jerusalem temple in AD 70 by the Romans. It was often seen, particularly in the uh, early centuries, as a great judgment of God on the uh, the Israelites because so many of the, 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 the laws given to Moses in the Torah are concerned with temple worship. Uh, and, and and that 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 center of the Israelite religion at that time was effectively well, was completely destroyed and has never been rebuilt. Uh, and so uh, what we what we have after that is is not the same identical religion. It morphed into what we call uh, rabbinic Judaism, which is centered around the study of the Torah. And ultimately, what really replaced that, particularly amongst Orthodox Jews, who were the major the only Jews for centuries, was the the Talmud, the study of the Talmud. That really became the focus of Jewish piety and life and study and work and everything was focused on and not so much the temple. Because in the, if you look at the New Testament, it's a lot of it's to do with the temple. You know, Jesus goes up to the temple in Matthew 24 uh, and, and uh, it, it really is central, but that completely disappeared. So I think arguably this is the judgment of God to destroy that... Uh, that that was the end of Israel's chosenness at that point. And that that would be a, a view that was very popular in the early centuries of the common era. I think. Yeah, I think you can obviously uh, that restricted more uh, kind of their role, but they were still left with whatever they inherited, and yeah. what they inherited was the best that was available. Yeah. When the Prophet sallallahu obviously appeared in Arabia, there were Christians and there were Jews there. Yeah, yeah. And the Jews that were there still had some of those teachings, retained yeah. some of these teachings. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but that, that obviously was weakened. And there's a more point you raised that I actually, Paul, deliberately avoided um, touching on it, getting into it in this video so it doesn't become a bit just too, too long, uh, which is basically the role of the Holy Land. The Holy mm. Land is mm. connected directly to the chosenness of the Israelites. In my view, and if we take into account the interpretation I'm presenting here of the chosenness of Israel, that holy land is no more, no more, is for the Israelites alone. Because what I see it, I see it as a source um, of kind of place where confirmed kind of, they will all, it will always kind of gather them together and be, be the place of focus where would help them to be always that same nation, the one nation that retained that heritage that from one century, one generation to another, one century to another. That role of the Holy Land being exclusively to the Israelite ended. Obviously, we all know what happened uh, when Omar, for instance, uh, opened uh, Palestine. 
Um, he didn't declare, oh, now we have to give it back to the Israelites, or to the Jews, and nobody to live there. Of course, we didn't, because that's not the, uh, the understanding of the Quran, and that's not the Islamic perspective. So that, that Holy Land, having this kind of particular land for them, in my view, is connected directly and helped them in doing that. What that also means is that now that they are not the chosen people of God, well, that land, they might still want to live there, but it has no spiritual purpose. In the plan of God, it has no purpose for them to be there. That's slightly different subject, but I just wanted to make yeah, yeah, this yeah. comment. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and I want to just um, to finish this slide by mentioning this particular verse, We have revealed to you, meaning Muhammad وسلم, the book in truth, confirming that which preceded it of the scripture uh, and, as, has, uh, and has authority uh, over it. So it's kind of meaning uh, that it is more authoritative, it's corrective, it's, it's a book that uh, clarifies um clarifies it can, can, can i just ask about that 5 4 you just quoted is it the the arabic word but is it mohaymin uh in mohaymin. Yes. Well, well, what does that what does that mean in this in in, in this context do you think so mohaymin it, it actually um uh, exegetes kind of you use two different concepts to explain it one of them uh, is as guide guidance so um, you read a lot of people, a lot of exegetes who translate this word, Muhaymin, as a guide. But Muhaymin also, when some something is um, kind of uh, has overall control, overall authority, right. overall, so something with higher, higher position, right. it's Muhaymin, it's kind of... Um, it's followed by a preposition ala on in Arabic, so it's something that's on top of something else, as in it kind of is more powerful, more authoritative, has more authority than whatever it is. So it's talking here about the uh, the other uh, scripture that uh, came uh, before the Quran. Meaning and confirming what was already there because the Quran does confirm um, really kind of fundamental aspects of monotheism, uh, the concept of prophets, the names of some of these prophets, etc., that are mentioned in the Torah and also, of course, in the uh, New Testament, in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. But also, it corrects a lot uh, of uh, of what's mentioned there. So it's 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 that meaning. Uh, having more authority as in spiritual authority more it's the correct book if you like is the one that right. um, puts right everything else it's, 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 it's a very rich term then it is it's quite it's quite implicit and correct. Quite, quite complex correct okay. correct and it is uh, i would say also it's one of the beautiful names of allah yes indeed, indeed. al muhaymin yeah thank you okay so um i think i'm going to just stop the video for now uh right um <clears throat> just to mention also something that a lot of uh, viewers um are familiar with which is a prayer uh abrahamic prayer that he made in mecca mentioned in the quran in which he prayed for a prophet to appear there among the people of Mecca. And what's interesting, and that uh, prayer, uh, with the, which is made in uh, verse uh, 2, in chapter 2, verse 129, O Lord, and send among them a messenger from themselves who will create, who will recite to them your verses, teach them the book and wisdom, and purify them. Indeed, you are the mighty, the wise. 2, 129. And uh, that, that prayer is is confirmed three times in the Quran in three verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirmed that this happened. So he responded, uh, answered uh, Abraham prayer. And the reason I mentioned here in this particular context and the current discussion is because this is Abraham calling for effectively a prophet from the lineage of Ishmael, because that's in Mecca. 
That is the understanding of Abraham. Abraham did not think that everything was going to happen through the lineage of Isaac. That's um, uh, one important uh, point. So um, what this then uh, also tells us is that the chosenness of the Israelites uh, lasted for centuries, but it ended. They are no more the chosen people of God. Uh, but there is something even worse that developed, um, which is not only the fact that the chosenness is claimed to have continued and never stopped, but it's even worse in that chosenness was equated to being best. Yeah, yeah. The chosen and best are presented as one and the same. And but as we said, as we uh, saw earlier, that isn't actually the case. They chosen to be host nation. And obviously uh, what Christians did, as they always do, if there's any misunderstanding, they're the first to borrow it. So they borrowed that misunderstanding uh, from the Tanakh and they applied it. So what did the Christians do now? Let's talk a little bit about what Christians did with this concept of chosenness. So. Um, the, the Old Testament or the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, is partly authentic, um, slightly authentic or whatever. So the Christians, what they did, uh, they took that partly authentic, uh, lightly, slightly authentic book and interpreted it in the light of the inauthentic New Testament. And what you ended up with is a, is a bizarre kind of theology that made really very little sense. There are two types of theology that concerns us, to concern, concern us for this discussion. These are known as a replacement theology, uh, 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 or they call superstitionism, um, and then the dispensationalism, uh, which I'll talk about um, later. So with replacement theology, uh, you have uh, the, the claim is that uh, the New Testament church has replaced Israel as the chosen people of God. Uh, another way of putting it is that uh, the spiritual Israel, which is the church, meaning the Christian community, uh, has replaced ethnic Israel. So we had ethnic Israel, now we have a spiritual Israel. And obviously one uh, consequence of that, um, an extension of this idea, is the naming of the Hebrew Bible as Old Testament. Uh, this was uh, this um, name was introduced by Meleto of Sardis, uh, who died uh, around the middle, um, well, after the middle uh, of the second century. And then obviously Tertullian in the following century introduced the term New Testament. And then suddenly you have this connection between these two. What's connecting them is actually the concept of chosenness. That's how we ended up with that. But then we know that somebody like Marcion, for instance, who lived uh, early, um, uh, died around the, the middle of the second century, rejected that concept. And he said, this God has nothing to do with this God. The God of the New Testament has nothing to do with the God of the uh, Hebrew uh, Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one kind of uh, reason or one um, consequence of the concept of uh, chosenness being borrowed now by the church. So a concept that was completely misunderstood by the uh, in the Hebrew Bible, misrepresented in the Hebrew Bible, borrowed by the uh, uh, people of the New Testament, uh, and then added uh, kind of their own version of misunderstanding to this concept. At times, uh, a term that's used uh, called uh, fulfillment theology, that's usually used as being less offensive because every, obviously anything you say now could be considered to be offensive when it comes to deal with um, Jewish heritage or something like that. So that uh, at times is used, and uh, it's often claimed that uh, it's a, it's a, um, the, the the it's Israel's picture uh, uh, of the kind of the true Bible the, the the true chosen people of God was fulfilled in the Christian Church. So that's really what it means um, in fulfillment. And there are um, the superstitionism is divided into types. The main major things that are talking about is punitive. Punitive when uh, it says that uh, the Israelites were replaced uh, as because they were punished because they rejected the Messiah. Yeah. 
And that was actually adopted by a lot of people. Origen believed that. Um, Martin Luther believed that. Um, whereas uh, also there's another kind they call economic. And this is like, it just got the clan replaced Okay. those ethnic group was replaced by, was, uh, by a non-ethnic group. And I think Melet of Sardis um, is said to uh, have uh, said that. What's interesting about replacement theology is that does not believe in the restoration of Israel. Put it in, in kind of different way. It's, uh, it brings less violence to the world. Uh, that's what it means. It does not believe in the restoration of Israel. Uh, some superstitionists believe that believe in the salvation of Israel, but in terms of being incorporated in the in the church, so effectively accepting uh, Jesus as as the Messiah, etc. But a restoration of Israel itself, uh, no, it is not. Paul, however, if you read Romans. Um, 9-11, he actually, he does not leave the Israelite out of, of chosenness. He still actually uh, commits to the Israelites and they have a role as a nation. Um, but the, the problem, where does this replacement theology come from? It's actually from Hebrews uh, chapter 8. Uh, this book that um, traditionally is attributed to Paul. It has no reference. It's anonymous, actually. It's not an epistle. It's not a letter. Uh, but it is usually... Um, uh, kind of attributed to him, and, uh, and that was why. So I just would very briefly. People didn't realize that the uh, the letters to the Hebrews uh, is not the book. It's not the Old Testament. This is an actual letter in, in in the New Testament was included in the canon of the New Testament, the list of biblical books, because it was thought by people called the early fathers, early Christian leaders, to be by the Apostle Paul. That was why it was included. But as far as I'm aware, no one thinks that today. There's no no reason no one thinks it's by Paul because the writing style, the content, every reason imaginable leads us to conclude it's not like Paul's authentic letters. So the irony is we have a letter in the Bible that's actually perhaps shouldn't even be there according to the criteria used to put it in there in the first place. But the King, the King James Version does actually have the, the, the probably the most widely read English translation of the Bible. Actually, it does state it's by Paul, but no one thinks that. Literally, no one thinks it's by Paul these days. Well, actually, even Origen and Tertullian said that, according to them, it wasn't written by Paul, but by an acquaintance of Paul. So based on his notes. So even those who believe that it is scripture had to accept that it wasn't actually written by Paul, tried to find a way of linking, yeah. linking it to Paul. And these are early um, uh, kind of fathers of the of the church yeah. so if we go to the next slide okay. okay so okay so i talked about what's known as replacement theology well actually it's a more accurately described as a replacement of scripture theology yeah. yes. and this is ah. um, so, so hebrew 9 hebrew 8 sorry very important passage yeah quotes jeremiah I'm pretty sure you're aware of that. Um, oh, yeah. Paul. So this is what Jeremiah said. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the, of the land uh, of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their, their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house, with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, it's, yeah. this is particularly interesting because is this really the basis for replacement theology? In order to get to replacement theology, you have to replace this scripture first, and then you get to a replacement theology. Because what this is saying, two things. First of all, it does not say that Israel are no more the chosen people of God. The new the covenant is not with Israel. This is where the concept of spiritual Israel came from. How to deal with that? It's house of Israel, so Christians have to do something about it. Well, that does not mean the nation, the ethnic uh, nation of Israel. No, it means spiritual Israel. And um, so that's that where it was replaced. But actually, the text itself uh, speaks uh, about Israel. So it says that old covenant changed. The new covenant is still with Israel. 
there's no replacement. But yet at the same time, look at it. I mean, the new covenant is supposed to talk about the the position of the law um, uh, with these people. If anything, it's giving even higher authority uh, to the law. Exactly. Um, even bigger position, more yeah. importance, more prominence. Yeah. What did the uh, uh, Christians do with that text? Turn it absolutely upside down. Yeah. So replacement theology is based on this, but it does the exact opposite. So in other words, they could have chosen any other piece of text and did replacement theology. Replacement theology is actually as a replacement of scripture theology. They removed that and yeah. they came up with a, um, um, a concept that uh, does not uh, actually has no uh, no legs. Can I, can I just make, can make a few points about that? It's a really important passage, Jeremiah 31, 31. It's really great. You, and is often of very frequently mentioned by Christians, Christian missionaries, Christian apologists. And they say, look, we have this new covenant. This is the Christian covenant. Uh, and this is the prediction, the prophecy of this coming of this new Christian covenant. Um, and the problem is, when you actually look at this prophecy, alleged prophecy, Jeremiah 31, well, it's not alleged, it is a prophecy, uh, uh, you've highlighted some key points. Uh, I will put my law within them. So Torah observance is still at the heart, literally and metaphorically, of, of this new covenant. But that is precisely what these Christians have rejected. They have rejected this covenant because, for example, the kosher food laws, uh, which Jesus upheld according to uh, the, Jesus was a Torah observant Jew. Uh, Paul said, you know, you can abandon those. You don't have to follow the, the Torah. And the whole, in fact, most of the Torah is simply abandoned, abrogated. Only very few, perhaps some of the, one of the 10, a couple of the 10 commandments, perhaps, you know, they shall not kill, not commit adultery, not commit. But the vast majority of the commandments have been abandoned. Some, some key ones, including, I would argue, you shall have no other gods before me by introducing this polytheistic kind of element to Tawhid. Uh, echad, no longer Echad, oneness, it's threeness rather than oneness. So um, th th this particular prophecy cannot be fulfilled in the Christian understanding because it simply isn't. It's rejected. It's the cont is evacuated. And I noticed the C Christians really ignore some key these key passages. They just kind of skip over them and don't really notice they're there. It's almost like a blindness. They, they simply don't look at what the text actually says. Uh, the law is still operative, they, but they have the, the law for them is abolished. The Torah is literally abolished and replaced with some other system, which won't go into that. So it's a very ironic use of this passage in Christian apologetics when they don't actually follow it at all. And, and the, the, the way of knowing that is by simply looking at the detail and it's simply not upheld, as you say. Yeah, it's uh, basically it's like quoting it <clears throat> just to conclude the exact opposite of what it says. Yes, I mean, exactly. you're better off not concluding, not quoting it. So I might as well just come up with that theory. Amazing. Theology and not, not referring to anything else. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Better off. Yeah, better off. Um, okay. Uh, exactly. So uh, let me just um, uh, stop this uh, for now. <clears throat> okay. Oh, right. So that was uh, that was replacement theology or uh, superstitionism. And then the other, as the other theology is dispensationalism. Yeah. The difference between the, these two is that replacement theology and superstitionism, superstitionism means superseding, so the church superseding Israel, the nation. Uh, but that actually was the mainstream theology for the majority of Christians for many, many centuries. Yeah. Whereas uh, this new theology, which started by um, John uh, Nelson Darby, uh, who died in the end of the 19th century, uh, and then it was confirmed by Cyrus um, uh, Scofield in his Bible, uh, uh, which was, um, I think, published early in the 20th century, and kind of solidified and confirmed and strengthened uh, the belief uh, that history is divided in those, those seven kind of dispensations or administrations or in God's plan, etc. And uh, that was Israel at some point. Now we have different one, etc. And what it did, it really strengthened Christian Zionism. It's not the origin of it. Uh, Christian Zionism is older than that, but it really gave it this impetus and put it at the heart of Protestant uh, theology, if you like, and for a lot of uh, Christians. It's very popular 
widespread and absolutely devastating to the world. Um, it's just one of those things uh, everybody has to suffer and live with. Um, then, now, so where are we now? So we looked at the Jewish understanding, the Hebrew Bible understanding of chosenness, and we, sh we, we, we saw that it make, made no sense. It just couldn't really live with tension between what it meant to be chosen and being what they were. And at the same time, we looked at the Christian understanding who tried to borrow that concept, repurpose it, uh, package it and claim it to themselves. Uh, obviously, they, they, they had to kind of borrow it from an already flawed source and then add on top of it their flawed thinking. And you ended up uh, with really something that can, I think, fairly described as frankly nonsense. It just doesn't make any sense. So, um, but the the worst the, the the worst aspect of all of that is, as I mentioned earlier, is really equating chosen uh, with best. So the chosen are the best, and that is so. The the, the Christians say we are the new chosen, uh, me, meaning we are the best. Uh, so um, replacement theology or suppositionism uh, talks uh, about them being their new chosen. Um, uh, whereas uh, uh, dispensationalism, talking about them being a new, a new chosen, both of them are complete misunderstanding of what chosenness is about and does not deal with the uh, tension and contradiction uh, that exist in the Bible, uh, only moves it from being ethnic to being non-ethnic, basically, the church is, is universal. There's no concept of hosting prophets. That is a Quranic, a Quranic concept mm -hmm. about the role, about the meaning of chosenness. It does not exist. And obviously, Christianity cannot claim to be chosen people of God simply because it's actually Paul's teachings. It's nothing to do with Jesus either. It, it, it's not monotheistic. Uh, it does not follow the Mosaic law. It doesn't have its own law. It has its theology uh, based on faith, the concept of faith in a very loose way that can give way to just about any kind of theology you can think of. So uh, Christianity has no legitimate claim to being the chosen people of God. So if we go back to the, okay, so, so chosen is not best. So this is one verse that tells us that this is the case, clarifies this mistake. وقالت اليهود والنصارى نحن أبناء الله وأحباؤه قل فلما يعذبكم فلما يعذبكم بذنوبكم بل أنتم بشر مما خلق يغفر لما يشاء ويعذب ما يشاء ولله ملك السماوات والأرض وما بينهما وإليه المصير. The Jews and the Christians say we are the children of Allah and His beloved say then why does He punish you for your sins? Rather you are human beings from among those who whom He has created. He forgives uh, whom uh, He will wish, wills and He punishes whom He wishes. So the, 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 we saw earlier that the chosen, uh, the chosenness uh, of uh, the Israelites in the Hebrew Bible is unconditional, whereas, and, and that is reflected in their argument, uh, we are the children of Allah and his beloved. And as we saw earlier, uh, they say, uh, their book say, says that uh, they were chosen because God loved them. God loved them. There's no other actually explanation other than that. Whereas the Quran says, you are just like any of his creation. Your concept, it again clarifies the tension I was talking about in the Hebrew Bible, but the, the concept of chosenness, the way they present it as being the equivalent of beloved of Allah, uh, best nation, uh, that concept, and the fact that uh, they were just treated like anybody else. Um, they were punished for their sins. Everything that uh, you know, um, uh, everybody else, other, any other nation went through, uh, they went through. There's absolutely nothing different. I mean, if anything, um, the Jews always talk about how miserable their history was. Well, okay, well, how do you then reconcile this with the claim that you are the chosen, meaning beloved, uh, and the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That tension that in the Bible lives there, will always be there, is completely clarified, done away with, and completely uh, refuted 
uh, when the Quran clarifies that uh, chosenness does not mean best. An Israelite, a Jew, if whether righteous or sinful, is no more or no less so than any other person, whether from the children of Israel or not from the children of Israel. There is no difference between the two. The concept of chosenness, chosenness of people, was a means, not a goal. And that's where, again, another way of looking at this concept. It wasn't a goal. It wasn't a goal. So when, when they were made, the chosen people of God, that does not mean it's done, finished, they were given everything that could be given to them by God. No, that was only setting the platform and saying, now I'm going to send you prophets, be good to them, follow them. And then if you follow them, you become the best nation. So you move from chosen people and you become best. And the chosen people is a collective concept. Best is individual. No nation just jumps like that as a nation because, because I'm calling myself, I belong to this, believe in that bigger group, I will then be admitted the Quran talks always about the individual identity. We are all, uh, talks about a book. Each one of us has a book as in a record of what we do individually. There is no concept of a record of a nation, a whole nation in the Quran. On the day of judgment, we are treated individually. It's repeated um, many times in the Quran. Uh, every one of you will uh, come to, the, to Allah as an individual. This concept is repeated uh, over uh, and over again in the Quran. So, so who is then the best nation? The best nation, as I mentioned, is really the nation of pious individuals. Those pious individuals make up the concept of uh, best nation in the Quran. And um, first of all, this is one verse. Uh, this concept is talked about in a number, many verses, and I've chosen some of these to show different aspects of it. Oh, people, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know each, each other, one another, one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. That is the concept of best in the Quran. So if somebody is righteous, uh, be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he or she becomes a member of the best nation. As you can see, the description here, it doesn't talk about, it's not discriminatory, doesn't talk about race, uh, color, um, social status, anything, absolutely none of that. It doesn't talk about Arabs or Hashemite, so the tribe of the Prophet وسلم, Arabia, it doesn't say uh, any of this. Uh, blood connection is completely and utterly irrelevant uh, to, the, to being a member, uh, to uh, the membership of uh, the nation, the best nation, as in the best people uh, in the sight of Allah. What matters is faith and good deeds. Al-Iman wal amal al-Salih. This binary concept in the Quran that occurs in so many, so many times. So meaning that your faith, pure of heart, pure of thinking in what you know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship him alone, etc. And the uh, amal, uh, what we do uh, as we live uh, our life. And because of that, this best nation has open membership. Its membership is open to anybody who would like to join it. This is another verse that talks specifically in those terms. <clears throat> you are the best nation produced for people in joining what's right and forbidding what's wrong and believing in Allah. If the people of the book had believed, it would have been better for them. Among them are believers, but most of them are disobedient. 
And so what you see here in this verse, first of all, the use of a specific term, umma, umma means nation, group of people, khayra ummatin. But look at the definition of that khayra umma, how it's defined. That umma is defined as enjoining what's right and forbidding what's wrong and believing in Allah. If you look at those two, uh, they are the two elements I mentioned earlier that occur uh, in the Quran, throughout the Quran, which is faith, uh, proper faith, proper belief, and uh, proper good works, good actions, good deeds. And these two are the components uh, of membership uh, of the best nation in, according to the Quran. And you, what's interesting as well is the contrast that this particular verse makes between this concept, Khaira Ummah, and the people of the book, meaning telling them, well, it, you, you're not just the people of the book just be, because you say that you say so, because you believe that you're so. But it's actually you can become Khaira Ummah, best nation, if you actually do what uh, is required for every and anybody who would like to become uh, a member uh, of, of Khaira Ummah, uh, that uh, best nation. And that best nation is the one nation, the same nation that existed throughout history. Because the message is one, the core of the message is one, the messengers came from the same God and the one God from Allah, teaching the same message throughout history. So <clears throat> this is one particular verse I, ch I chose because it's interesting. This verse, I couldn't cite the whole text. This verse occurs after uh, a long text, many verses, uh, that talked about a number of prophets that appeared at different stages in history. After it talks about all of those, it then concludes and says, indeed, this is your nation, one nation, and I am your Lord, so worship me. Beautiful. So present all of those prophets uh, and their followers, uh, by by implication, and say this is your ummah. So it's, it's it's addressing obviously the people who are being addressed in the Quran. So those who lived at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all the generations after that, you and me, Paul, and everyone else. So this is saying that this is your nation. This is the one nation uh, I have been. I've got only one nation. If anybody would like to talk about the nation of Allah, that is the nation of Allah, the nation of the prophets and the nation uh, of those who uh, followed those prophets. This is another example. Indeed, the people who have the best claim to Abraham, as in being best claim to being the closest to Abraham, are those who followed him. So those who followed him at the time and afterwards, this prophet, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi and those who believe and then it ends with Allah is the ally of the believers, anybody who believe. So if you want to claim to be connected to uh, Abraham, well, that's how you become connected to Abraham. Doesn't You don't have to and you won't need to be uh, from his uh, um, bloodline. That's how you become by uh, faith and, and good works. And the last verse I would like to quote here uh, is that this is, uh, to, in the Quran, talking about Musa, and among the people of Moses is a nation that guides by truth and establish, establishes justice by it. So the Quran is appraising a group, an ummah, a nation from the people of Moses. So this is just, it's open to everybody. And you can see the consistency, the justice, those who are interested in human rights, these are human rights. It cannot be more just, more, more fair, more even-handed than this. That's talking about Moses at the time of the prophet, his followers then. The other one is talking about connecting to Ibrahim. And the one before is talking about every prophet throughout history and the people who followed them. It's just so simple, so consistent, so clear, compelling, and powerful. Now, Muslims are often um, accused of hijacking uh, the concept of best nation. So 
the Jews accuse Christians of um, hijacking the concept of chosen, meaning best, and then the Christians of his the, accuse the Muslims, and the Jews accuse both of them, uh, Christians and Muslims. But is that a fair a criticism uh, that uh, Muslims have uh, hijacked this concept? I showed earlier that the concept of best nation is clearly nothing to do with Arabs, uh, followers or any particular prophet, etc. is a universal concept um, that extends over history of humanity uh, and it's open, its membership, this nation is open to everybody who meets its conditions. These are conditions set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But let's look at one particular verse which is very instructive. So here Allah is addressing the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam. And that which we have revealed to you of the, of the book is the truth, confirming what was before it. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with and seeing of his servants. Clearly a reference to the Quran here. But that's the verse I'm after. Then we cause those who have whom those we have chosen, meaning those who are going to inherit the book, the Quran, of our servants to inherit the book. So these are the people who the Quran um, came to, and that includes all the generations afterwards. Among them is he who wrongs himself. Among them is he who is a moderate, is moderate in his action, and among them is, is, is one uh, who is foremost in good deeds uh, by, by permission of Allah. Fantastic, it's just so beautiful. So uh, those who inherit the Quran, talking about the book here, are split into three groups. Uh, the fact that you, we inherited the Quran is no guarantee in its own. Uh, that we won't belong to the first group, meaning somebody who wrongs himself, so somebody who's uh, deluded, somebody who's gone wrong. Muqtasid means somebody who's kind of their actions are half and half, if you like. And sabiqun bil khair, those who are foremost uh, in, in, in good seeds, who take the initiative, who are keen on uh, living to the uh, expectations and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted from them. That, uh, in addition to the descriptions I uh, and the um, um, verses I quoted earlier, should leave no doubt whatsoever that any claim that the Quran copies what the Hebrew Bible does or the, uh, the New Testament and trying to present the concept of chosenness that is detached uh, from uh, or it has anything to do or link or, or defining best nation as anything anything other than being based on uh, faith and good deeds is actually wrong the quran has no other concept of best nation including when it deals with those who inherited the quran that's you paul myself and everybody else and just finally um, and before i finish with some remarks i'm gonna let's revisit the five terms i discussed earlier so remember we spoke about ikhtiyar choosing and tafdeel preferring and as, as i explained this is something a descriptive that's collective it's about hosting prophets and these custodians uh, of uh, the prophetic heritage and then the concept of ad and mithaq or covenant and that's individual that applies to everybody it does include that when a prophet is sent to you you must support them follow them help them etc you must not kill them you must not accuse them of lying etc so that is part of the concept of ahd mithaq but the concept of ikhtiyar is specifically or choosing uh, preferring is specifically about that unique role that Israel was given over centuries. As for the other kind of concept uh, or term, ni'mah or favor, but that applies to individuals uh, as it applies uh, to um, collectively. And it, it, it's a kind of um, universal term that describes spiritual uh, and also 
uh, earthly uh, favors. Um, now, the okay, I think I've come to the end. I'm going to just have a few words to say to re kind of recap on what we've discussed. Uh, just um, so. What we said here is that um, the concept of chosenness in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, is racial, um, is focused, uh, uh, is ethnocentric. And the Hebrew Bible equates uh, chosen in the way it talks about the Israelites, and it's a self-image, to best. So chosen means uh, the best. They are better than any, anyone else. And there is uh, unresolvable and continuous tension in the Bible between these two. How can this nation be beloved by Allah uh, or, uh, over every other nation? And at the same time, uh, it's a history that is um, pretty checkered with um, um, disobedience, etc. Christianity, um, obviously not to be outdone, copied that mis misunderstanding from the Hebrew Bible because it is obviously considers the uh, 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 Tanakh as scripture for them, uh, but then what they did, repurposed it, applied it to themselves, and came up with this idea that they are the new chosen people of God. Um, but chosenness actually, as we saw in the Quran, is a historical role, a role that played by the Israelites to host the prophets and provide that platform and protect them and help them in order to maintain uh, that uh, um, uh, message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sent. Uh, they were not perfect, but they were uh, the best uh, available. But that chosenness, that role, that unique role ended uh, completely when the Prophet Muhammad was sent. Everything that they were needed for at the time became and necessary, not needed. And what they could provide as a service to humanity, uh, people and jinn, was replaced by something that can provide the same in much better way, more authentic book, message, teachings, everywhere. So, um, and obviously we saw how that the concept of best nation in the Quran is a universal concept that does not discriminate against any particular groups uh, or individuals, universal, and covers everybody. Hmm. And I think that's about it, Paul. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely fantastic presentation. I learned a great deal. I uh, love, love the way you put it together. Very, very clear. And uh, it, it's shocking, the, the contrast, the juxtaposition between the, the ethno-nationalism of Zionism today versus the universalism and the inclusive nature of islam and that's rooted of course in the teachings of the quran itself and uh cl clearly uh w which has more prospect for being embraced by humanity as a whole w which is more benevolent and noble uh, um a deen a way of life before god honoring to god uh is, is very clear which which is which is that so thank you very much indeed sir uh, fantastic um until next time thank you